Good evening, everybody, and, and welcome to this uh, uh, inaugural lecture. My name is Charlie Jeffrey, uh, Senior Vice Principal and, and once of the parish of uh, social and political science, um, and still, of course. Um, great pleasure to, to introduce this evening Jonathan Hearn, our Professor of Political and Historical Sociology. Um, always a, a very special event um, because we have uh, here a, a range of colleagues, not just the ones that Jonathan normally talks to in uh, sociology, but others who have come to hear him profess about his subject. Uh, and it's always uh, an interesting challenge to profess uh, to, uh, to uh, people from a range of disciplines. That's compounded by, by having uh, family here as well. And it's a great uh, uh, pleasure this evening to welcome uh, Gail, uh, Jonathan's uh, partner, Iskra and Lovell, uh, Mary, uh, mother-in-law, uh, and we have more in-laws in the form of Malcolm, Lindsay, and, uh, and Magnus. And uh, Malcolm, I, I understand, was, was once a rector of this university, so we have a particular distinction in the audience uh, tonight. So welcome to to all of those. Um, Jonathan's family in the United States will have uh, an opportunity to, uh, to look at this because we're uh, recording it. Um, uh, and at the forefront of, of those waiting for the recording, uh, Jonathan's father, Arnold. Um, so um, great to have all of those uh, with us tonight. Uh, Jonathan's been here since 1998, having done MSc and PhD at City University of New York and uh, his BA before that at Bard uh, College, so here for a while. Um, I think it's fair to say he's now uh, a key figure in the latest phase of a long tradition of, uh, of outstanding sociological thought at Edinburgh, and it's great to see a number of representatives of that tradition uh, here in the audience tonight. Jonathan's work has, has um, uh, looked at a range of uh, key themes in sociology, identity, power, authority, legitimacy, competition. Um, but I know him in particular because of, of the way he's carried forward a, a particular uh, feature of, of work in Edinburgh sociology around the sociology of, uh, of nationalism. Uh, Jonathan is a, a multifaceted academic. Uh, he has uh, all of the res research distinctions that you can, can shake sticks at. Uh, but alongside that, he's a committed teacher. Um, as I think all of our leading uh, academics should be, uh, Jonathan doesn't just teach at the advanced level, but uh, also teaches at the introductory level. Um, and I see from nine notes, he's... Uh, currently doing a unit in Sociology 1B, which is uh, very, very good uh, to hear. Um, he's also a, a, an academic citizen uh, par excellence, and I've been again, looking through the CV that was sent. We've got uh, five stints as program director of one or other uh, MSc. He's been deputy head and is now head of uh, sociology. He was a director of undergraduate teaching in the School of Social and Political Science, and he was deputy head of school uh, for a period uh, when I was head of school. And I know I relied on him an awful lot for uh, support and wise counsel. So he's all of those things, and as well a talented guitarist. Um, for those of you who are interested in that dimension of him, the Chili Dogs uh, play on Thursdays at the Cannons Gate but have been known also to enliven a number of social occasions here uh, at uh, the university, uh, though not uh, at the reception later this evening. I think uh, that wouldn't be quite appropriate. So in all of those respects, I think Jonathan is, is an outstanding uh, colleague, uh, and it's going to be a delight to listen to him uh, giving his inaugural lecture on uh, the theme uh, In Search of Liberal Society. Jonathan, please. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a bit odd to uh, give a lecture while peering over your own shoulder, um, but I'll see how that goes. Uh, and I just want to say the first thing is, 
in search of liberal society, I didn't promise I would find it. I just said I'm looking for it. Okay. Um, uh, I usually speak mostly from notes, but I've got a text, the nature of the occasion, I've got a text that I'll kind of generally follow. Um, so the first thing to say is to thank everyone for being here um, and uh, to say that, uh, you know, acknowledgement, uh, sorry, the first thing to say is that all achievements are collective in some sense and this is no exception. I would not be here except for the support of a long list of family and friends. Uh, being an academic uh, requires a curious balance of self-questioning and cussed self-belief. My parents, the late Eleanor Hearn and Arnold Hearn, uh, repeatedly told me when I was young that I was clever and I believed them. I, don't know. Uh, uh, I know my ability to believe in myself stems from their belief in me. Uh, the love and patience and support uh, of my uh, family, of Gail McLeod, Partner. partner always sounds too much like a business arrangement, that's companion. Uh, Iskra and Lovell, uh, my daughter and son, Mary McLeod, uh, my mother-in-law who's been very generous to us over the years, and then there's some other in-laws there who uh, know that they're there. Uh, I am, uh, among other things, a teacher, as, as Charlie was saying, and made by a long line of teachers. And um, in particular, I'd like to acknowledge being inspired and shaped by these people in particular. The uh, uh, list of people, I and mean, that goes all the time from when I was in school to uh, the present. There's been a custom in recent inaugural lectures to create a, a wall, a bit like a Vietnam memorial of everybody who's ever uh, done anything for you. And I, I've eschewed that custom and just trimmed it down to a list of teachers in particular. Um, so when I was in school, David Mahler, Judy Walter, Yova Rosanoff, Anibal <coughs> Gonzalez, Davis McCauley, when I dabbled in education at the University of Texas, Larry Carver, Lewis Mackey, at Bard College, Mario Bick, Michelle Dominey, Diana Brown, Bill Griffiths, A.J. Ayer, uh, at CUNY, uh, where I did my PhD, Jane Schneider, my supervisor, Eric Wolf, Gerald Sider, Vincent Capanzano, Del Jones, May Ebihara, Leif Mullings, Shirley Lindenbaum, Mark Lila, who was actually at NYU, but I took course from him. Uh, and then since I've come here, although, uh, that teacher-student relationship hasn't exactly been the mode. I've had lots of sort of intellectual companions, uh, and particularly since I've been here, I'd like to acknowledge David McCrone, Lindsay Patterson, Russell Keat, Tony Cohen, uh, Jimmy Kennedy, and John Glassford, who is a, a friend of mine who, he's a Scottish guy who moved to Texas to teach in Texas when I moved to Scotland to teach in Scotland. So we're keeping the cosmic balance uh, uh, in order. Um, so that's just to say that uh, those are all people who um, have shaped me as a teacher, and that's very important to me. The second thing to say is that this will be a fairly traditional inaugural lecture, uh, attempting to give an overview of my career so far rather than focusing on a single recent part of my research. Uh, beyond sheer vanity and respect for tradition, this is because I want to convey a sense of an intellectually driven life. Too often today, academics are viewed simply as specialists moving from one research project to the next, responding to the calls of others. The sense of scholars as people involved in a continuous effort to develop a unified take on the world, wherever that leads, through thick and through thin, is often lost. So I'd like this talk to reassure junior colleagues that that is still a legitimate way to be. I have a little pencil note here, the proverbial elephant, uh, which is to say, most of us know the story of a group of blind men who stumble across an elephant and each one grabs a different part and develops a very different sense of what the elephant is because they don't see the whole. Well, this talk is an attempt to sketch the elephant rather than just give you the trunk or the tail or the, the legs or the ears. Uh, and so it will be kind of uh, sketchy in that sense. When thinking about how to approach this lecture, I was reminded of what is for me the perennial dinner party problem. Someone asks, what do you do? And you have to give a succinct, hopefully not too boring answer. Inevitably, I say something that uh, captures a small slice of what I do, but I cut myself short so as not to abuse common courtesy. But tonight, I get to be that guy who says, hmm, since you've asked, uh, and then pins you to the wall for the next 40 minutes, leaving you no escape. Uh, actually, the doors aren't locked if you need to go. Uh, I remember once being told for one of my first college essays, don't advance a thesis with a question. I got a B on that essay. Well, now I'm going to get my revenge and advance a whole inaugural lecture with a series of questions. Take that, Professor Carver. The first one is, what's in a name? The title of my personal chair is Professor of Political and Historical Sociology. What a mouthful. They even got it wrong on my office door. Uh, uh, 
which says in tiny letters, Professor of Politics and Historical Sociology. I briefly held a post, half post in politics when I first came here. Perhaps they're trying to lure me back. Some of you know that I have an overriding interest in the concept of power in the social sciences. But Professor of Power, while more pithy, uh, <laughs> sounded a little too threatening. So I didn't go down that route. But uh, why this particular mouthful? Or to elaborate this, the question, political and historical sociology of what? Of everything? Well, me being me, yes. <laughs> but if I had to be more specific, I'd say of liberal society. That large, peculiar historical formation, that confluence of capitalism, democracy, science, secularism, and pluralism that we here live within. A confluence that has seemed so robust, but may be more fragile than we had imagined. Several years ago, in preparation for one of my many office moves, I was clearing out old papers and came across the short two-page statement that I had included in my application to the City University of New York PhD program in anthropology. In it, I admitted that I didn't have a specific topic, but I knew that I wanted to read more Marx and more Weber and to train, uh, uh, train the anthropological perspective on modern, complex Western society, by which I now realize I meant what I'm now calling liberal society. So this is just a, a slide indicating that in recent years, this term liberal society has kind of emerged and become more prominent in various articles and chapters that I've written. Uh, so even though I don't have a book called liberal society or in search of liberal society, it's a kind of uh, theme that was always there that has become more uh, apparent to me as I've gone on. And that's what brought me to Scotland. Uh, when I first took an interest in Scotland, I had no idea of studying nationalism or national identity. I was fascinated by a country and a culture that sat on the near periphery of the historical epicenter of modern capitalism, namely England. I was fascinated uh, by its ambivalent relationship to that position, uh, a participant in the growth of capitalism and empire, but also with strong strains of resistance. It wasn't until I had made a couple of reconnaissance trips to Scotland that the topic of nationalism and the moral and historical discourses that swirled around it provided an anchor for that wider, more fundamental fascination. This begins uh, to answer the next question. Well, how did I get here? Of course, I borrowed this one from David Byrne. That's the talking head in the big suit, not the sociologist from Sheffield. Uh, um, and if the sociologist from Sheffield finds that he showed up in my inaugural le lecture, he'll be baffled because I don't know the guy. Um, uh, but you know, give him something to talk about with his kids. Uh, so not just to Scotland, not how, just how did I get here, but to this point of view on the world, including my current research focus on the nature and development of competition in modern society, which I will come to towards the end of this talk. It's a long story about my intellectual disposition, disposition and how it has developed. So to begin at the beginning, as a child, I didn't like school. I was shy, awkward, and unsociable. Uh, my wife's saying, what's changed? Um, uh, I didn't like the regimentation, having to focus on one's attention on whatever was prescribed at a given moment. I would feign illness, convincing myself I was ill to get out of school. Don't listen, level. Okay. Uh, my parents being very broad-minded, addressed the problem by sending me from the time I was 10 to a very experimental free school, i.e. hippie school, called Greenbrier, based on the radical child-centered educational philosophies of A.S. Neal and John Holt. Uh, it was about a 45-minute bus ride outside of Austin, Texas, where I grew up, on 172 wood wooded acres with a small creek running along one border. That's the aforementioned bus. Um, I am in there somewhere, but I won't tell you where. Um, <laughs> Uh, and those are the aforementioned hippies. Um, uh, the freeform buildings inspired by R. Beckminster Filler were built by the staff and the surrounding supportive community. I learned at my own pace with help from staff, alternately burying myself in a book, learning guitar, uh, working through maths workbooks, catching snakes and turtles, collecting arrowheads in the neighboring fields, and helping to build more buildings. There were no tests, grades, or graduation. The freedom made me very stubborn about how I direct my own mental energies and attention and skeptical about formal education. In my late teens, uh, I earned a general equivalency diploma, uh, which is something you get when you haven't graduated high school and you can show that you could have if you had. Uh, and 
took a few courses at Austin Community College, but until my mid-20s, I worked various jobs to make a living and pursued my first love, which was music mixed with theater. Uh, and I'm also in that picture too, but uh, again, don't look too hard. Um, taking a few more courses out of, uh, in my spare time, uh, as an undeclared major at the University of Texas convinced me that the academic route might be an alternative. And when the music career seemed to be going nowhere, I decided to go back to school in earnest, getting my BA in social studies, concentrating in anthropology at Bard College, which is a small liberal arts college in upstate New York. And then I went on to do my PhD in cultural anthropology at the CUNY Graduate Center of New York City. That uh, department, the, the PhD program in, at CUNY, uh, was characterized by a Marxian approach called political economy with strengths in peasant studies, the anthropology of Europe, urban anthropology, and emphasis on placing ethnographic cases in their political and historical contexts. It was also still a four-field program. That is, one, of the expected, one that expected familiarity and coursework across the four subfields of American anthropology that is cultural anthropology, linguistic anthropology, physical anthropology, and archeology. span uh, This is a perspective that has stayed with me uh, through my conversion to the field of sociology and continues to kind of shape my approach to things. In truth, I regard myself as an undisciplined or perhaps ill-disciplined generalist at heart. It was at Bard that I first encountered the ideas of uh, David Hume, who has served as a kind of muse for my thinking ever since, and which led to a wider, enduring interest in the Scottish Enlightenment. Hence, two of my recent publications are about Adam Smith as a, as a kind of sociological theorist. But again, that's an example of uh, that's only one part of the elephant. And if I'd spent today talking about that work, you'd have no sense of the elephant. And that's, that's what you need. Um, what attracts me to the Scottish Enlightenment is precisely the lack of disciplinary boundaries and the desire to place humankind in its natural setting. And this obviously added to the appeal of coming to work in Edinburgh, the seat of that enlightenment. From my PhD to today, I see my work, or research to give it a dignified name, uh, as moving through three phases. Uh, this is just an odd slide from uh, the library in the castle at uh, Cardiff Castle, which I, I've just always loved those monkeys fiddling around with that book, but no other reason why it's there. Uh, over that time, I have published four books that map onto these phases with some complication in regard to the most recent book. Staying in the biographical mode, let me outline the three phases first and how those books arose in relation to them. I always knew from a young age that I was attracted to the problem of how to reconceptualize the social world in the largest sense, its main features and tendencies. Is the human history one about growing rationality, technology, organizational complexity, labor power, just power itself, or all of the above? For me, exploring these questions required a long view, from the Neolithic to the present, hence the attraction to four-field anthropology. But I also knew that this impulse towards, uh, uh, general, towards the general and the macroscopic risked cultivating a kind of disengaged abstraction, untroubled by how things, uh, any of this might play out on the ground in real people's lives. So by a kind of countervailing force, I was also attracted to the extreme particularism of ethnographic case study research. Thus again, the anthropological shoe seemed to fit. Having said this, the challenge of ethnography uh, for me has always been to locate very concrete localized data within a larger uh, context of society, history, economics, and politics. I've never been very interested in theoretical problems uh, that stay within the microscopic uh, world of ethnographic investigation. The point is to see things up close and then pull back uh, to see better how they fit into a bigger picture and to deal with the challenges of relating the very particular to the very general. So my first phase of these three phases was my empirical ethnographic phase. My senior project as an undergraduate at Bard was a study of a small, <laughs> uh, of a small uh, local Episcopal parish church near the college, uh, 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 near Bard College, and its origins in the, in, a, in the legacy from the 19th century of landed elites in upstate New York. My PhD field work in 1993 and 94, a long time ago, uh, involved a year of participant observation 
interviews, and historical reading based in Edinburgh. Uh, I was working with groups such as the Campaign for a Scottish Parliament, Scotland United, the Vigil on Colton Hill. This is some of the Vigil folks uh, in this picture from that time. Common Cause, the Adult Learning Project in Gorgi Dal Rai, uh, to get a composite view uh, of what I called the autonomous movement in an attempt to get a coverall term for all the shades from devolution to independence. I saw the movement at that time as very much framed by a defense of uh, the somewhat idealized values of the mid 20th century welfare state and social democracy under the pressures of Thatcherism, deindustrialization, and what we would now routinely call neoliberalism. I was concerned to show that this was not some monster of ethnographic identity erupting from the primordial id, nor was it sheer instrumental pursuit of power inspired by North Sea oil. I saw it as a moral critique uh, of the direction that capitalist society was taking by people in a place and at, uh, that at that time felt marginal to that shift in direction and that fortuitously, fortuitously had an already existing history and identity through which it could construct that critique. This led to my first book, Claiming Scotland, National Identity and Liberal Culture. And I point out that uh, there were various uh, stabs when I was you know, working on the book about what, what to put in the subtitle. Uh, and this slightly uh, contradictory phrase, liberal culture, was an early indication of me wrestling with this question of what is, you know, what is liberal society or what is liberal culture and how, how can, you know, because we think of liberalism as intrinsically kind of denaturalized and abstracted and individualist, how can it be culture as well? Shortly after I took up my first post in sociology and politics at Edinburgh, uh, a three-year fixed-term post that replaced 50% of David McCrone and 50% of Alice Brown, uh, how could you replace those two? I don't know. Um, but I tried, uh, and I became involved in a bid to the Liverhulme Trust to support a multi-method team research project, International Identity and Constitutional Change, led by David McCrone uh, and Frank Beckhofer. I and another anthropologist, Nigel Rapport, under the guidance of Tony Cohen, did, an inst did institutionally embedded ethnographic studies meant to get at how national identity is shaped uh, and comes into play in banal everyday settings. My study was to be based in the Bank of Scotland, uh, was to be based in the Bank of Scotland, but before uh, the field could, be could begin, in a context of increasing competition in the banking sector, Bank of Scotland uh, went into merger with Halifax to form HBOS. Uh, they played around with various acronyms and decided against BOSH. Um, HBOS is what they called it. Uh, this altered the, the context of research. Instead of Scottish identity within an august Scottish institution, I researched an encounter between two banks, two sets of staff, one predominantly Scottish, the other predominantly English. The research ended up being about how certain stereotypes of Scottish and English identities were mapped onto the experience of merger and organizational cultures. Uh, as people tried to make sense of their lives and the power they had over their own lives in that situation. This led to various articles and chapters, but to no book at the time. That was 16 years ago. That was the last time I did ethnographic research. This may partly to do, uh, be to do with starting a family uh, and with the fact that my fieldwork uh, context had been somewhat ephemeral difficult to go back to and, and develop further. Uh, but by the end of the HBOS research, I, I felt an increasing need for some conceptual clarification. Not only had I been researching nationalism and national identity for several years, I had also been teaching on these topics, especially in the Nationalism Studies MSc program set up by David McCrone and Tom Nairn back in 1995. I needed to think through more systematically the array of theories and debates that I was working in. I had a sense of working in an intellectual space that was uh, a conceptual mess in need of housekeeping. So my research shifted from the empirical and ethnographic to the more theoretical, or to be more precise, the conceptual. I believe that the th term theory uh, is best reserved for actual hypotheses, whether general or particular, about uh, causal processes. But theories in turn are built, out of, in, uh, built in part out of something more fundamental, that is, concepts. So, for instance, a theory of how nationalism came about depends on how uh, we conceptualize nations and nationalism in the first place, not to mention human nature, social interaction, all sorts of other core concepts. My second book, uh, Rethinking Nationalism, uh, 
sought to do two things. First, to help me clarify my own thinking uh, and position, and second, to provide an alternative path through this literature for those learning about and or familiar with this literature, but trying to find a way through it. I am a strong believer that trying to teach, uh, whether in a classroom or through a book, is one of the most rigorous ways of mastering our ideas. Particularly in the, in the exploration and refinement of ideas, there can be no clear distinction between research and teaching. At any rate, writing this book and other pieces that spun off from it consolidated in my mind the view that nationalism's most defining feature is the problem of popular rule in modern mass forms of society. This emerged across the 18th century in a dynamic uh, interaction sphere that spanned the North Atlantic, created by imperial expansion and failure. Historically, the leading edge of nationalism has been, a more democratic, has been its more democratic and liberal forms, with highly ethnically marked variants as secondary reactions to the emergence of that form. This form has taken hold and spread because of its advantages in the social organization of power. As, indi as indicated, this work has led me to begin thinking more systematically about the nature of social power. Since my undergraduate days studying anthropology, I've been introduced, especially by my teacher Mario Bick, to the idea that power is in some sense the most fundamental social science concept of all. This is part of what led me to do uh, my PhD at CUNY, where this view was prevalent. This was particularly true under the leading influence of the anthropologist Eric Wolf, who articulated a strong critique of anthropology's tendency to obscure power relations within communities and their encompassing colonial contexts with functionalist, idealist, and holistic conceptions of culture. While Eric was not my PhD supervisor, one of his students, Jane Schneider, to my good fortune, was. I've always seen myself as working in an intellectual tradition that these two anthropologists are exemplars of, and I want to take this occasion to acknowledge that. So even as a student, the importance of understanding power for, uh, power for social inquiry was a basic con uh, conviction. But I also felt that I was not ready to pursue this particular great white whale at that stage. However, after about a decade in post at Edinburgh, and having tried my hand at a more uh, theoretical inquiry in my second book, I felt ready. This led to my third book, Theorizing Power. Here, again, the strategy, uh, sorry, the strategy was to seek uh, self-clarification and a position through the production of a book that could serve those trying to learn more about the subject. This book, and again other writing spinning off from it, led me to the con uh, conclusion that power is a collective capacity to achieve ends intimately bound up with power as the control of some over others. We increase our power to do things by submitting to complex social organizations of power, and this is the central dynamic of social evolution. Moreover, our theories of power are products of the liberal forms of society in which they are generated, which leads them to be extremely ambivalent about power, precisely because a core ideal is that the power of some over others should be minimized. And yet, our society depends on extensive hierarchies of control. That contradiction, I think, is very central to how our discourse about the theorization of power develops. This book marked the apogee of my middle period, another uh, uh, grand phrase, uh, of conceptual and theoretical clarification. Coming out of it, I found myself wanting to come back to more empirical questions, but now with a clearer sense of my own abiding interest in the historical development of social power, particularly in regard to the nature and emergence of liberal society. I'm now working on a large project on the transformation and institutionalization of competition in modern liberal uh, society, how the elaboration of competition is basic to the very formation of liberal society, structuring its forms of domination, authority, and legitimacy, in short, power. Uh, this was begun under a mid-career fellowship from the Independent Social Research Foundation, whose aim to support blue skies thinking I am extremely grateful for. But before I sketch this project, by way of concluding this lecture, there's one more book to account for. After the financial crisis of 2007 and 8, I began to think about returning to the HBOS research, although I was by then well into my more theoretical conceptual phase. I arranged a book contract with Manchester University Press and eventually found the time to write and polish the book, which came out in uh, last July under the title Salvage Ethnography in the, in the Financial Sector, The Path to Economic Crisis in Scotland. 
This gave me a chance to return to the empirical ethnographic data, but also to wrestle with the epistemological question of how, histor uh, how historical perspective and context alters the significance of empirical data. H. Boss uh, uh, went under and was acquired by Lloyd's in the crisis. And the attitudes of my informants in the original research collected in 2001 and 2002 now looked more like harbingers of what would go wrong. Anxieties about increasing competition, uh, pressures, the, the decline of an older, more uh, traditional sense of what a bank was for a more uh, commercially driven kind of bank, all these kinds of things that people were talking about and expressing anxiety about. Uh, so they look like harbingers of what would go wrong in ways that only, uh, can only be fully contextualized from the later vantage point. The, the meaning of the data looks different from the later vantage point. At any rate, themes of the effects of pervasive competition and how power operates and interacts at the levels of organization and personal identities shape the interpretations of the data in ways that could only have happened for me personally after that middle period of more theoretical reflection. So this leads to the, uh, towards the final question. This is a, uh, these are some slides. Uh, uh, the final question is what now, right? Um, and uh, if you just Google image competition, uh, you get tons of these kind of aphoristic uh, slides that you can uh, look through. And I, I, I like them, they're, uh, um, they're like uh, really condensed, uh, uh, taking the temperature of, of, of contemporary culture in, in liberal society. So phrases like, always compete. Competition uh, breeds character, which is the backbone of success. Winners are made, not born. Yes? Or look in the mirror. That's your competition. That's an interesting, pose an interesting question. Can you compete with yourself? Uh, after the competition, are you both the winner and the loser? You know? How does that work? Um, uh, and I like this, this other one. If you, can, if you can't win, make the guy ahead of you uh, break the record, right? So there's, there's always a consolation prize, and that's why we should believe in this thing. Some of these, a lot of these TV shows you get now where um, uh, mediocre singers compete with each other to win a prize. Um, and uh, if you watch them closely, they're not just about the person who wins. It's, it's a repeated object lesson in how to deal with losing. Each, each loser is kind of guided through how they should feel good about themselves and they, you know, and they shouldn't feel bad. So, um, you know, this, this is a nice way to kind of get a quick taste of what I'm talking about. So my current research, which aims towards another book project, larger than my previous ones, focuses on the phenomenon of competition as a way of getting uh, at my larger abiding interest in the nature and origins of liberal society and of developing my enduring thesis that the social organization of power must be at the center of any explanation. The first thing to say here uh, is that this interest in competition does not indicate that I am a particular fan of competition, nor that by disposition I am particularly competitive. I think most who know me would recognize that I'm not a terribly competitive person by nature. Uh, if there is a personal motivation here connected to my own character, it probably has more to do with turning around to face the beast that has dogged me all my life. When I used to play in bands uh, in the Austin music scene, I remember hating the competitive dynamic that would develop between bands, followers, music genres. It always seemed to me contrary to the spirit of the thing. And having taken refuge in the halls of academe in later life, I've been disappointed to see an ever more formally competitive ethos and set of structures seep into that practice over the years. Not that there hasn't always been rivalry amongst scholars and visions within departments and things like that, but institutions of learning take an ever stronger hand in defining the measures of achievement and channeling intellectual behavior into satisfying those measures. More topically, focusing on competition provides a more concrete way often into, into often woolly discussions come commiserations regarding the spread of neoliberalism to, into all walks of life. We can see uh, competitive principles advanced as matters of policy in government, education, economics, of course, but also in popular culture, from sports to television shows featuring all sorts of competitions among chefs and bakers and singers and B-list celebrities. How long can you stay in a jungle? I don't know. Um, mentally, there is a question about whether competition is being uh, elaborated as a kind of symbolic form in current society, and if so, why? 
But the thesis I am working on uh, goes much deeper than the present period. I call it the domestication of competition. Contrary to the view that the ramping up of competition is primarily an aspect of the neoliberal era of the last 40 years or so, I argue that the fundamental shift took place around the long 18th century in the circum-Atlantic world, uh, uh, world, the same context that saw the initial formation of the modern nation state. The thesis is simple. With the weakening of traditional forms of authority and legitimacy rooted in aristocracies and religion, uh, and the rise of ideas of popular rule, new ways of sanctioning social distributions of power were needed. Ways that seemed to bypass uh, the contradictions of discredited traditional inherited authority. The deliberate harnessing and cultivation of competition across an array of social practices provides a way of doing this. Not only is the burgeoning capitalist economy incre- increasing the realized at, by institutionalizing its competitive dynamics, but democratic government is fundamentally premised on competition between parties. Just think of uh, Mr. Putin in Russia. Uh, law on competition between adversaries, uh, science on competition between theories, and more widely, public opinion is shaped by, communicative, uh, by a communicative arena of competition among ideas and worldviews. The key historical counter-movement to all this is the suppression of competition amongst those providing services of lethal force. In other words, for all this to happen, the old feudal tradition of competition between armed aristocrats and their retained followers had to be circumscribed into unified professional militaries serving the wills of civilian governments. In short, the social dynamic of competition was domesticated, brought under greater state control in the case of the military, and at the same time deliberately cultivated in highly formalized and ritualized ways in the spheres spheres of economics, politics, and ideas. So where many have seen the rise of competition as primarily connected to the rise of capitalism, I disagree. This is only one of its contexts. The Enlightenment released us from from the tyrannies of traditional aristocratic and religious authority to deliver us into the hands of competition as a new quasi-naturalistic source for the transcendent legitimation of power and authority. We live in systematically competitive societies in which the competitive principle operates across its spectrum of institutions, government, law, education, economics, religion, political opinion, and so on. The transformation has been a, a systemic one triggered by the problem of popular rule, not simply an effect of the economy on the rest of society. This is a big thesis. I have been refining the theoretical side of the argument by relating my understanding of competition to various theories of social evolution with which I have a very complex combination of agreement and disagreement. I've been developing the empirical side of the argument by studying the specific histories of the emergence of key uh, competitive agents in the modern period, economic firms, political parties, opinion-forming institutions, and civil society. To return to the title of my personal chair, the aim is a political, historical, and sociological account of how competition came to be a governing principle for our lives. So, a final question. Why this puzzle? Why competition? I would like to point out here, some of you who frequent uh, SBS inaugural lectures uh, may be under the impression that it's a de rigueur to refer to Tom Burns. It's not. Um, He just comes up a lot. Uh, But I would like to point out on this occasion, you have the current head of sociology citing the original head of sociology. So hear that, Toby and Fiona. Um, Well. As Tom Burns, the founder of the Edinburgh Sociology Department, once put it, the practice of sociology is criticism, to criticize or raise questions about claims and assumptions concerning the value or meaning of conduct and achievement. It is the business of sociologists to conduct a critical debate in this sense with the public about its equipment of social institutions. Competition is one of those social institutions, a very fundamental one. If we accept that an aim of of social science uh, is to provide a critique of society, I think we must be clear about what we mean by critique. In my view, to criticize is to distinguish between the good and bad examples of some phenomenon according to some clear criteria. A jazz critic who hates all jazz isn't a jazz critic at all. They're just somebody who doesn't like jazz. (laughs) As a critic of competition, I would see my task as distinguishing between the good forms and the bad forms of competition. Competition can be a good thing, 
when it is engaged in freely, in a mutual endeavor to refine knowledge and practice for general benefit, and properly focused on its true object. However, competition is frequently coerced, oriented to particularistic benefit, and displaced onto approximate objects. Should the aim of banking competition be the provision of sound lending to communities or the return of profit to shareholders? Should the aim of political competition be the honing of arguments about the collective good or simply the capture of the levers of government? And should the aim of intellectual competition be the refinement of ideas or the achievement of high ref scores and research funding? Well, I think you can see where this is going. So I'll end on a question and stop there. Thank you. And we all wanted the answer about the ref. <laughs> Um, perhaps downstairs over a, a glass of wine in a moment. Um, uh, this, was, this was started out with uh, the, the elephant uh, metaphor, uh, and I think Jonathan has sketched a very fine elephant tonight, um, giving that, that overview of his, his career and the intellectual development uh, therein. Uh, and it, it, it's always um, especially rewarding uh, when when a, an inaugural lecturer gives insights that you wouldn't normally uh, uh, come across or, or know about. So I, I loved the hippie school. Um, I was straining to see which one uh, you might have been in the picture. Couldn't manage it. Um, and, and how that may have been a formative element in who you became, the, the, the informality of the education. Um, likewise, the theatre group in, in Austin, which was wonderful, and I think I did spot you there. Um, and, and the PhD experience with a, um, a, a particular tradition in the, in the graduate school you were in, giving you things which have followed you uh, through the rest of, of your career and made you the undisciplined generalist that you proudly proclaim to be. And I rather, I rather like that. Uh, I rather liked also the way that you, you want to see things both uh, close up uh, and then pull back uh, to get the bigger picture. I think too many academics are either in one place or the other and don't uh, make that uh, bridge. Uh, and I think you gave us uh, a real sense of how through your books you have been moving to different parts of, uh, of, of that spectrum. Uh, the, embodied, the embedded ethnography in, in HBOS not leading to a book in the near term but helping you to think about nationalism uh, and power, coming back to the, to the ethnography and thinking then further on, on, on competition where you are now. Um, and yeah, that was for me um, especially interesting because I haven't followed your work in the last couple of years. Uh, but that sense of the pervasiveness of competition in our social order from the music scene uh, back in Austin through to, uh, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, uh, and indeed the contemporary university and, and REF and research funding and so on. Uh, and what, what struck me as especially significant was the way that you were talking about that pervasiveness in the sense of its, also of its domestication in our social order. Um, and ending up with, with Tom Burns there, um, social order or our equipment of social institutions and our obligation to promote a critical debate uh, thereon as, as social scientists. Um, what I think you've shown us in the lecture is that you're doing that with great originality, but you're also doing it in the context of a tradition, and I think it was lovely to finish with the, uh, the Tom Burns quote, the founder of sociology here, uh, and you carrying the, the baton forward. So uh, a wonderful uh, lecture, uh, uh, and I congratulate you on uh, giving it to us so well. Thank you.